So uh, welcome everybody back here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center of CUNY. Um, this is the last panel here at the uh, Graduate Center, the Siegel Center of Concrete. It's our 20th anniversary edition. It's a very important uh, festival for us, but this also is a very significant and important panel for us and something we all might and should focus even more on. It, it is uh, one of the three big questions, the holy um, trinity, there's time, money, but there's space in theater and um and uh, with the space the light goes on and rightly so um there is a lot of space but also space is missing um, and from all the discussions the panels we had actually what was in the very center of it always always came back is about you know to have space and to connect people to space and the right people to the right space um, so this is what we're going to talk about. I would like to welcome our viewers from HowlRound, who is nationally wide broadcast. This is an important discussion, and uh, we didn't want to have it on Zoom, but uh, so I feel it is important that we meet in person, see all each other, and um, and listen. And I think it's a lot about listening, perhaps also even radical listening. But these are masters in their field. These are people who have dedicated their lives, part of their professional career, to have spaces create spaces and connect people so something to learn from it not only how they get messy but also the way how they think and we are in a complicated moment a dangerous moment for theater there's a lot of talk about doom and gloom but i think as the prelude festival show there's a lot is happening but there are also people behind we sometimes we do not know and i didn't know all of you uh, before who are doing work which is groundwork and is basic work is foundational and um, I would like to hear, of course, you know, what's all on your mind, what you are doing, all your uh, institutions. One we is could make it the sacred spaces. Karen will give us a short video. It's like one or two minutes. Bear with us. But um, we are now getting really an insight into what a city provides. And people think about institutions. People think about the city as a structure. Ultimately, it's often the individuals who make things happen. These are people here. So uh, something to... Uh, really listen carefully to and also get ideas inspired and also hopefully um, will contribute that we are part of the change we want to see and you all uh, are doing this so that's why I'm so honored to have you all with us that you took our time and uh, so thank you and the format will be that we go from Randy down the line but following our um, our uh, 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 prelude the example of this talk maybe I'll ask randomly some people in the audience, so if it comes to space and you're an artist or you're working theater, what do you think? Can I just, can I start with you? Like short statement. Short statement. Uh, there are a lot of empty buildings and vacant spots, and they should be filled with theater and for civic uh, needs as well. So I think that we need those spaces opened to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elaine. When we hold spaces for for people, um, whether it's for theater or healing, um, it's super important. And I hope that funding and um, it can secure artists jobs in the future. No real comment at this moment. I'm just curious, can you listen? Okay. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think about space for artists? Uh, more like a space in mind uh, is more important for to big space, for big, big room is very important for me. Mm -hmm. so space of mind? Yes. 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 Hi, everyone. Uh, testing. Hi, everyone. So when I think of space, I think of two things. I think of usurping space and taking up space because, because as an artist, I'm not only a singular entity, I'm a village within a village. So much of my work is about opening doors and usurping space as a Black queer artist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Randy, what do you think about space? Hi, everybody. I think about space all the time. It's something I think about every single day. Um, so I'll introduce myself uh, and um, tell you a little bit about my organization, the organization I'm the executive director of. 
Uh, my name is Randy Berry. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And uh, I'm the executive director of Indie Space, which is a community organizer and industry cooperative that provides radically transparent, equitable, and responsive funding, real estate programs, professional development, and advocacy for individual artists, small companies, and indie venues. We, I'm gonna talk about the real estate programming in this context, but of course it's inextricably linked to the funding conversation that we have to have. Um, indie Space was created to address systemic inequities in real estate uh, to make sure that those of us that have not been able to operate space um, can, and that they have the tools and network and research and advocacy um, and, and knowledge in order to operate space efficiently and sustainably. We do that in a bunch of different ways. Uh, two of the main ways that we support space making is through a free advisory and consulting program where we work with artists that are facing a real estate transition challenge or opportunity. And we provide them all the resources we have at our fingertips with real estate experience in order to help them navigate whatever that challenge is. I should say that I'm an indie theater maker myself and I worked in commercial real estate as my day job because I couldn't afford to pay myself as an artist. And I was the director of operations for the investment properties group at CBRE for a large, a long time and worked on $11 billion in real estate transactions, all while I was rehearsing for free in the vacant spaces of the buildings that we were selling. Yeah. Yes, and working to, with my real estate colleagues, you know, creating fundraisers that I know they could, were the only people that could afford to come to and trying to figure out how to make my way through um, using the day job that I had to have in order to like access space for my, myself and my theater company. And so Indie Space was created uh, with one of my partners at CBRE at the time. He's not at CBRE anymore, but the financial analyst uh, was a big indie theater supporter and said, why don't we do what we were already doing with the Indie Theater Fund for artists through real estate? So that free advisory and consulting program takes all of the network and resources and you know knowledge that we built in that work. And we have a board that is familiar, like has real estate experience. And we hand that right over to the artists that we work with. The other way is uh, we're developing um, affordable spaces in unique ways. We're trying to partner with community boards, with like-minded developers, with public space, and with local venues to create cooperative spaces, to create collaborative spaces, to create inclusive spaces that are um, affordable and long-term or permanent. That's what we're doing right now. Is that good for now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would just say, I think our way forward is collaborative spaces and the sharing of resources. I think it's always been critical, but it's especially critical right now. So, and there's a lot of that happening, not just with my organization, but with every organization that's up here. So I'm excited to have this conversation and make sure that everybody knows what resources are there and available to them. All right, Randy. Uh, Katniss Thompson Zachary here. She, her pronouns. Uh, I'm the director of programming and justice initiatives at Dance NYC. So, um, primarily, I'm a dance maker, producer uh, from Trinidad and Tobago originally, and I've been with Dance NYC for about the last four years. Uh, the organization is about going on 12 years old as its own entity, and it is the service organization that um, promotes the appreciation and um, advancement of dance in New York City and the metropolitan area through justice, equity, and inclusion. And so we do that through a lot of the programming that we do and the leadership training and the way that we gather people to talk about issues around equity. Um, we do that through the visibility that we offer on our website, dance.nyc, which is like a one-stop shop for auditions and listings and community calendars for um, uh, resources that the dance community needs. We also do that through uh, one of our regrant, well, our regranting programs. One of which is the rehearsal space subsidy program, of which my friend here is a uh, grantee. 
Um, and that is a program that is uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation that allows us to partner with um, spaces and venues across the five boroughs. And we subsidize their spaces so that they can offer them to artists at much lower costs, right? Between eight and $20 an hour, which you know at this point is really, it's like <laughs> basically, um, but we make it available that, you know, the, the communities that these spaces serve can serve their people basically. Um, so that the rehearsal space subsidy program is a big one and is one that, you know, I would say really kind of upholds our sector. Um, I joked on another talk that I did that, you know, when people walk into a space and they say it's $20, I'm like, yo, you know, that's not a real rate. Anytime you get a space that's $20 or less, someone is subsidizing it. Um, and it's so prevalent now that people take it for granted, but, you know, we know behind the scenes that that kind of intervention is what is making it possible for so many dance makers to do their work, to train, to meet, to ideate, to create new works. So um, yeah, that's just a, like a really critical um, program. Uh, we also serve the field through um, our advocacy, which is another place I think that space comes up a lot. Um, and then finally through our research, right? Like the kind of case making that went into even a program like the rehearsal space subsidy coming to life was pulling from some of the data that we collected from the dance field that said that among um, immigrant and foreign born artists, affordable space is one of the most critical needs. Among BIPOC dance makers and dance artists, critical space, affordable critical space was what they needed the most, right? So part of our work is, um, you know, going into the field, finding out what people are experiencing, where their needs are, where the barriers are, um, building the data, the actionable data that people can use, right? To act for their funding colleagues at city council, how can we change policies that make some of these spaces more accessible? Um, and putting that data in the hands of dance makers, in the hands of wonderful people like Kruhandi, um, so that we can start to make change to make things more affordable. So that's what I did. Thank you, Candice. Good afternoon, evening, everyone. I am Aaron L. McKinney, he, him, his, and I'm the executive director of High Arts, formerly the Hip Hop Theater Festival. We are a 23-year-old organization. Uh, we do theater, music, dance, and visual art dedicated to hip hop and urban culture. So we really serve uh, artists of the global majority slash people of color, basically. Um, and so space for us, um, like I said, we do theater, music, dance, and visual art. Um, space for us, we are, you know, very fortunate to be located in Art Space PS 109. Um, we have been there since they opened in 2015 up in East Harlem. And um, we, since we've been there and we are one of the anchor ten commercial tenants, um, we have been able to move into a larger space. So now we occupy a 3,500 square foot uh, studio slash classroom slash office slash rehearsal space. Um, and then we also have access to a shared black box and dance studio um, within the building. Um, and this building, if you don't know, our space PS 109 are, is a, um, used to be a school and now it's 90 affordable artist housing units with four uh, commercial uh, arts organizations in the building that share some of the space. So again, theater, music, dance, visual art, dedicated to hip hop and urban culture. Um, thanks to Dance NYC, we can offer subsidized uh, rates for dance and movement artists. And so right now we can offer rehearsal rates uh, for uh, $10 an hour, which basically is nothing. Um, but the problem is not many people know about it. Um, and, you know, especially mainly for artists of color in East Harlem, because what we've heard is that there is no space in East Harlem for rehearsal, which is not true. There is space. It's just not accessible. And so that's the question that we're trying to answer, making sure that there is accessible space for our artists in East Harlem. Um, we also, one of our programs is called the One Wall Movement, um, speaking of space. Um, and what we do is we find walls in the city 
and we give opportunities and support uh, artists, uh, mainly artists of color, who do not have the opportunity to put up large scale murals. So if you go to Art Space PS 109, you will see a large mural on the side of the building that was done by one of our artists. And if you go to a building, it's on 112th between uh, Frederick Douglass and Adam Clayton Powell. Um, there's another, our second mural that was put up there um, called Flower Grows in Harlem. Um, and that's another mural. So speaking of space, not only, you know, we're talking about rehearsal spaces, but, you know, wall space. We think about, like I said, the work we do is dedicated to hip hop culture. Um, so there are graffiti artists, there are writing artists um, that they need space to do their work. And so that's one of our main missions is to make sure that we are providing space. Um, we are an organization that focuses on process. And so we always say process over product. Um, and so um, we just want to make sure that there is space, again, especially for artists of color, because most artists of color are conditioned to, uh, to, to have a product, to make a product. They're never really supported in the process. Um, which is very important because they don't have room to explore, to figure out what works, what doesn't work, um, to really take their work to the next level. So um, that's who we are, High Arts. You can always go to our website, www.hi-artsnyc.org to find out about all of our programming, um, to rent, you know, to find out about, you know, our rental spaces, or you can follow us on social media, all platforms, H-I-A-R-T-S-N-Y-C. So I'll end there and we can talk more after everyone else is gone. Thanks, Erin. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anna Fiore. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am the Director of Artist Services at LMCC, um, which was founded as the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, um, but since the 80s has really served as the Arts Council for the Borough of Manhattan, and we work um, throughout the entire borough. Um, within the artist services work that we do, we are primarily focused on being a re-grantor of public and private funding um, for independent artists as well as small emerging organizations um, throughout the borough who are doing any sort of community engaged programming and presentations. Um, and then most pertinent to today's conversation, we um, are a residency provider um, for artists in need of studio space, um, working across disciplines um, and providing space um, primarily in temporarily vacant office spaces in Lower Manhattan. Um, so this is a model that we have been working in since the 90s. Um, we originally were able to um, move into space on the 92nd and 93rd floors of the World Trade Center um, at that time um, and provide space originally just for visual artists and then it has you know expanded since then. But working with a um, roving temporary model means that we work with a lot of different uh, real estate owners and developers and we move pretty much every year in terms of where the residency is housed. Um, it also means that we are working in a studio model that is um, pretty DIY and scrappy, but that I think allows us to help foster collaboration and artist communities to be built um, because folks are working in spaces that are more open and collective and shared, um, especially as with the affordability crisis that we have in the city, those kinds of communal artist communities are occurring less naturally and they're less available for folks to form those or they're happening maybe in less dense neighborhoods um, in the city. Um, and it is also in an effort to be a bridge or be the intermediary between some of these big developers and corporations and space owners um, in Lower Manhattan for artists to be able to gain access to those spaces um, and to be able to take over the space for that purpose. Um, and so, you know, we like to say we've changed what it means to work in Lower Manhattan um, through that program. Um, the other residency program I'll just touch quickly on is we've also been out on Governor's Island um, for over a decade now. We were one of the first um, year-round semi-permanent tenants um, back in 2010 um, that started working on the island and we are able to provide year-round studio space um, to artists out there. Um, we have really beautiful um, dance rehearsal studios out there as well as uh, space for writers and theater makers and um, visual artists. Um, 
And I think that this is very much in alignment with our goals and desires to ensure that as new development is happening in the city and especially new public spaces are being created, that arts are a part of the inception of that work and remain you know, core um, to the way that space is getting used and doled out um, throughout the city. And so to be able to be part of an arts community that now is really flourishing on Governor's Island and is full of a lot of organizations and to um, have helped foster that um, and helped kind of demonstrate the way that that could be important to the development of um, that public space um, has been really important. Um, and it's been really wonderful to continue to be able to yeah, support artists there. Um, the last thing I'll touch on very quickly, which is a pseudo residency, but is another way to think about space for artists, um, is that we are also a provider of the Sukasa program, um, which is a partnership with the city, and this places artists in residence in senior centers um, throughout the city to provide space um, primarily for um, activities with older adults um, and for artists who are interested in a creative aging practice and a participatory practice that incorporates um, older adults into their process and work. Um, so other, you know, public venues in which um, artists can have a more active role and have a job and receive a wage. Um, yeah, leave it there. Awesome. It's great to be on this panel with some amazing folks. My name is Baba Israel, he, him. I'm the artistic director of the performance project based at the University Settlement. I first have to say the great Sun Ra, space is the place. I just had to get that out. Um, and I think I want to also acknowledge in my own upbringing, I grew up in the living theater. And so I want to sort of bring in a knowledge of tradition of street theater, of theater that comes, that claims space, takes over space, that takes space. I grew up in a children's theater company, a political company, theater company. We used to do performances in Washington Square Park. And for my early formative years as an artist, I was a street performer for many years. So just a reminder that artists can just take space at any moment. But that is also a privilege and there are limitations. But I just want to acknowledge that spirit in New York because I think the way that New York has always, New York artists have always just claimed space, permit or not. So I wanted to just acknowledge that. But now to speak in my institutional hat for a second. Um, I, the performance project is based at the University Settlement, which is, I think, a unique model as part of what attracted me to this, this work is that we're a small arts program based in a very large social service organization where we probably have 30 buildings that are connected to us throughout Brooklyn and the Lower East Side. Um, and we also have our own theater in the Lower East Side, which, you know, and our building has been there, we've been there since the late 1800s. So there's a lot of history. Aaron, you guys come see our space recently. We have an artist in common. Um, and so that, what that affords us in a way, the fact that we have our own theater space gives us a lot of flexibility when it comes to ticket prices, being able to comp community members, being able to be really flexible with how we use and share space. I think a couple of things that I'll, sh that I'll share specifically that we've been working on around space, I think partnership is key. So we've been working on a program with BRIC, who have been our core partners in something called the Intergenerational Community Arts Council. And the idea with that program has been really to switch who's at the decision-making um, place of arts curation and, and programming. And so this is a group of 15 public housing residents from downtown Brooklyn who uh, design call, uh, call for artists in residence and then collaborate with that artist to create events that specifically happen not in arts venues, but in cornerstone community centers in public housing. And so that's been a really important new model for us, which is to not just create work in our theater space, but to actually create work within the cornerstone community centers that we manage. So the settlement manages three cornerstones two in Brooklyn, one in the Lower East Side. And for, if you don't know what a cornerstone is, that's a community center that's embedded in the public housing residence. And so we worked with a wonderful artist called Pia Monique Murray recently on a series of events. Um, and really the idea was to bring production value, to bring um, artistic integrity into spaces which often are not invested in. Um, and, to, and to really celebrate the amazing artists that are in those communities and in those spaces making work. And, and to have the resources of both of our institutions to support that process. 
So I think that's one thing that's been exciting for me is like breaking open where we can do art making. And it doesn't have to just be in a traditional theater environment, but working in these cornerstones has been a real breakthrough for us. And then I think also, um, you know, we have an artist in residence program, which brings artists to collaborate with all of our various community programs that might be seniors, that might be early childhood, that might be after school, that might be mental health, that might be adult literacy, recent immigrants who are learning English. And so what that allows us to do is to really embed artists in all of those spaces. So artists are working in community centers, after school programs, senior centers, early childhood programs. And we try to find a balance between that interaction serving their development and their own creative process, but also creating opportunities for artists to develop, rehearse and practice and develop process in those spaces too. Um, we give every artist in residence a minimum of 100 hours of free space. And that's really important to us. Night? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's I, I know, but you got to hold it then. Okay. Sorry. Right. I'm, I'm going to be odd. Uh, so, I'm going to ask everybody to like stand up and just stretch for a second. It was <laughs> and then we're going to take our arms and we're just going to like make a little heart. And then we're like, <laughs> we're a big heart. So, Thank you for Now, now you might just like uh, go and give a hug to anybody who's right next to you. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So, I believe that space, you can make theater happen, connection happen in any space, anywhere, at any time. Yes. And uh, I've been doing this since 1989, finding space for artists. Um, I started with Reza Abdo, and who he knows, uh, he would not, he needed space that no one had ever used. So I would find him space, old hotels, beautiful hotels, empty spaces everywhere. So what do I do? I give space to artists, as you said. Empty spaces in New York should be used. So we give space for anything you can dream of, we will give it to you for, basically. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes, Shasham, that's what we do. So, yeah, so uh, small businesses, uh, free art classes. We do a lot of free art classes. Um, Charles Esperanza, he gets a free space. He makes books for Harper's. Uh, and then in exchange for that free space, he teaches at uh, transitional housing. Uh, theater, we have a, we're doing a lot of theater. We just got a theater, so New Ohio, you know, 154 Christopher Street. So we are going to give that out for free. That's what I'm going to try to write grants for. Um, and Oh yes, we are, we're talking to the DCLA to make it the state of art theater. So it's really beautiful. And we're getting a new lighting system, new sound system uh, for that. Uh, we're expanding. That's right, we're in Salamanca, New York, Ithaca. <laughs> so yeah, we're really, so we're in Salamanca. Same thing, we get, we get prop, prop owners donate space to us and then we give it to artists. That's what we do. Uh, we have 13 million worth of space. We have 45 locations right now. Uh, and there you go. I'm going to pass it on to you guys. So, um, so much to talk about. First, do you sense something is changing in New York City when it comes to space, better or worse? Mm. <laughs> I would say absolutely. Um, I think with with coming out of the pandemics, um, there is a question about accessibility and um, who has access to space, um, who can afford space, um, what can be done in the space. There, to be honest, I think there's a lot of gatekeeping that has always happened, but now is being questioned um, and now is being challenged. And so um, some of those places that have been comfortable gatekeeping those spaces 
um, are now being challenged and, you know, things are being turned on its head and um, our, our people are, the artists are really looking into how to gain more access to space. Um, who's running these spaces? What are these spaces used for? Um, who is, you know, gatekeeping these spaces? And, um, you know, asking the questions. My opinion, more artists need to be in charge of spaces. Um, and yeah, that's just the symbol of it. More artists need to be in charge of spaces because who knows how to use the space, you know, like, like an artist. It's nice to observe this by the few practicing artists on the stage here. Yeah. And, and at High Arts, our staff, um, we have an eight-person staff, four full-time, four part-time. Each staff member has an arts practice outside of their administration work. Yeah, the thing I'll say, uh, so we were tracking studio closures. You know, again, I'm a dance. Um, and the study we released in 2021 said that 18 studios had closed from the pandemic. And then there were names of more that got released after that. Um, so I think in dance especially, it was sort of, well, not sort of, it was a survival of the fittest, right? It's like people who could, um, you know, take on debt, people who could survive by other means, people who could take their classes online, people whose studio numbers didn't go down to zero are the ones who kind of made it to the other side. Um, and I do think now the other thing that I'm just thinking about is that where people gra gravitate to use space is also dependent on their relationships with the like the community that the space is in and also the people that are holding the keys right like who's running that space like a space I love to go to is one that's like one neighborhood over from me I know the owner I feel a sense of home when I go there so I think in terms of at least the people the artists that I'm in uh, close contact with a big part of what's driving us to take up space in certain areas, like where we want to rehearse, where we want to make work, um, is to find that sense of home and community. That's huge. I really appreciate that. And I think it's there's a lot of artists I feel struggling with isolation at the moment because I think inflation is intense, rents are intense, people are working extraordinary hours, you know, to survive and make their work. And I think one of the things is how do we cultivate um, environments where artists can not only have focused time to rehearse in a closed door, but also the informal social interactions. I think Indie Space, you've been doing something really cool with this sort of open office hours model, you know, where you invite people to hang out and, and cross pollinate. I ran a theater in England uh, called Contact Theater. And we were well funded by the government because it's England. So, you know, we were able to give out extraordinary amounts of free space. But for me, the cafe was so important because it was a place where artists, when they came out of rehearsal or were getting ready to go into rehearsal or coming out with me, chat, cross pollinate, share. And so I feel like that's just an element I want to hold up is, you know, how, how do we create those moments for artists to because I think sometimes those kinds of meetings, conversations, sharings actually give people the fuel to keep going even more than just the isolated rehearsal process. And so that sense of home is so vital. All right, one of the spaces we're working on, we're calling home. We were talking about that today, right? So we were trying to create spaces that feel like a home for indie theater, especially because so many organizations are itinerant. And they're not meant to. Some artists want to run space, but not all artists want to run space, right? Like some really want someone else to run it, um, but they want to be in community with that that group or people that are running it, and they want it to feel fair and just and safe and all of those things. And um, I forgot when I was talking before I mentioned the one thing we do with our programming, but I forgot to mention the spaces <laughs> that we're working on. So we have the West Village Rehearsal Co-op. This is a 99 year lease for a dollar a year that we were able to work together with the community board, CB2 in Manhattan, our city council members, the speaker of the city council, and then my wonderful partners, which are here Art Center, the New Ohio and Rattlestick Playwrights Theater. Um, those are three operating theaters in that neighborhood that were really seeking, they, need, they were bursting at the seams and needed additional rehearsal space, but also we wanted to make sure that that resource was not only for those that already had space, right? 
So we operate at six months out of the year and they each get two months out of the year. And because we were able to collaborate with the developer and the community board, um, our max, max, max um, is gonna be $10 or it has been $10 an hour. In most cases, we've been able to give it for between $5 and $8 an hour. So partnership is important, but what I, what's different, I, I think there are some things that are different, but I think space and it being too expensive and not easy enough to get is a problem that I've been trying to create theater here for 25 years and it's been my same problem. It's why I had to get a job in real estate to rehearse in the buildings we were selling because I couldn't afford to rehearse otherwise. And I certainly couldn't afford to pay any artists, myself included, if I was paying for a rehearsal space. So that feels same old. What's not the same, at least in the last 25 years, but was a few decades before that, is how much available space there is right now. 80 million square feet of vacant space in the city, um, not to mention spaces that are theaters, but remain empty almost all the time. Um, that is, we have to change that. Like that's the key, right? To me, if we're worried about the collapse of the American theater and we're worried about large institutions, we need to start thinking about who's holding keys, right? I don't want the American theater to collapse. I actually think there's a lot of artists that want institute. Not everybody, let me be fair, let me be clear. We want fair pay, we wanna be paid, we wanna have access, but we don't all want to operate buildings because it's not necessarily healthy for everybody to operate buildings. But those that are have that have all this vacant space, we need to start rethinking how we rebuild together. Sometimes some of them are going to have to fail, right? But we don't want all of them to fail. And we want to rethink instead how we can fill those spaces with people that have been systemically excluded from those spaces. And I think we do that together. That's where the city, state, and philanthropy can step in and help us. They could say small itinerant theater companies, individual artists, global majority artists, disabled artists. Most of those big institutions are accessible spaces, right? So many spaces in New York City are not ADA compliant. And because people rent those spaces, they don't have the capacity to, or the ability that even if they had the money, they can't add an elevator. So, we need to take these accessible spaces that have been privately funded, that have been publicly funded and rethink who's using them. In partnership, I think we can help each other get through this moment, which is a difficult moment for everybody. I have a thought. What is it? One is to piggyback on what you're saying. Um, the one of the things that's happening now is that the city of yes that the city is working on in terms of changing the zoning laws maybe you know about this in more granular detail but i know that one of the amendments that they're planning is to be able to turn uh, to make storefronts in certain um zones uh available for use by like art studios or dance studios which were not available before to take up those kinds of spaces. I think there's some weird rule that you could only be in like the back room or upstairs. And that's one of the things that they're on, that's on the table right now, but we just need to make sure that it actually happens. And the other thing I wanted to say is about um, in terms of what's changed maybe, or what should be changing is this idea of, not idea, this, the practice of making these spaces more accessible, especially for people who, use wheelchairs or need, you know, accommodations that should be given, but aren't in a lot of our old architecture. Um, and so that being top of mind for all of us now in terms of how we program, how we invest, um, and how we, we look at the spaces that we occupy every day. And there was a third thing that I think has eluded me. So I will say that it's no longer, but oh, the third thing is our friend, uh, Karen who works at um, Sacred Places. I know I don't know if the video is here, but I do want to just mention that um, Dan and Mikey uh, and Randy are both in partnership with her, and they work to make sure that Sacred Places create partnerships with artists because they have so much space. Let's have a look at the video. So Karen is on her way in an airplane right now. She couldn't come. It's a partnership for Sacred Spaces. So it is temples, synagogues, churches, mosques. 
mosques and uh, what else? Um, yeah, faith spaces. Yeah, yeah. clusters. Hi, I'm Karen Lassie, the director of strategic partnerships for partners for sacred places. And I'm so sorry I can't be with you today. Alas, the stars and my itinerary does not align at this time around. I'm currently in the final phase of our annual state performers in sacred places program. So if you are a performer in New York City looking for creation space, or if you are just looking for a more affordable space, the NYC Performers and Sacred Places program would be good for you. Presented in partnership with Dance NYC and Indie Space, this program is seeking artists who are in native space for performance, rehearsal, classroom, office, new maintenance. The program is also recruiting sacred places throughout New York City who are interested in sharing their space with New York City artists and performers, and there is no fee to participate. For full information and details, you can go to sacredplaces.org slash NYC. The registration is on that same webpage, sacredplaces.org slash NYC. Just click on the button in the red box. Our last two training sessions will be on November 4th of this year and April 13th of next year. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And please contact me if you have any questions at all. And I look forward to meeting you soon. Beautiful. I think one thing I'd like to talk a little bit about, I'm curious to see what you all feel about this, is there's space, the physicality of space, but then there's also the culture and quality of space. And I think that's just as important to discuss. And I know one thing that I feel positive about, one thing we've gotten feedback from the artists that we work with is that they like coming into our building because it's a building full of elders, young people, local community members, folks who are in the arts, not in the arts. It's like, it feels like New York when they walk in our building. And that's not always true of institutions in New York. And I think that's a question. I know some artists have worked with some institutions and felt alienated, felt unwelcome, felt the way they were greeted by security, didn't feel good. Um, and so I just wanted to raise that too, like the quality of your experience and how you enter and exit a space really affects your practice, particularly when you're working in very vulnerable ways in performance. So. I just wanted to throw that here. I think that that's another quality that we should all be paying attention to. And I think, you know, folks up here are, but it's just something I wanted to raise. Well, and that's what I was going to say um, earlier is I think um, a lot of what we've been alluding to and talking about and talking around is community building yeah. as a part of space um, and space usage and space accessibility. Um, I think it's very important, as you were saying, like, the, the comfort level of being in space. Um, you know, at High Arts, we try to say that we are creating a hub or a home for artists. Like eventually we want artists just to stop by, come sit on the floor and, you know, have coffee and, you know, write a book, read a book, you know, it doesn't matter. But somewhere where they feel safe and secure to do what they do or just be, to exist. Um, and I think that's a thing that we need to consider as far as space is like, you know, the, the community building aspect of it. Who are we in the community with? How are we treating our community members as we're in this space? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I've been heartened to see, like one thing I want to shout out about Brick that I really appreciate is that stoop, you know what I mean? That And that when, when venues have a social space that does not require a ticket to be purchased to engage and enter, you know, and I think, um, you know, wherever that we can encourage that to happen, I think it, it, it helps to contribute to accessibility because then that social process of people coming and gathering my oh, then there's a little flyer, or oh, there's a free rehearsal space, or this, I run, I bumped into this person. So many things happen because of organic communication and word of mouth. So I think continuing to set a precedent that if new space is open in New York, that there is a public social space that does not require ticket entry and whose main focus is not just the selling of tickets, you know, and lobbies should not just be for selling tickets, they should be places of public gathering. And I think that's like a really important value that I want to highlight. Yeah, I'm also just thinking about how community building is so essential to a successful shared space model. Um, and that it allows us to actually move from a place where it feels like we have limited resources to a place that actually feels abundant and full of possibility when you are embraced by and sharing um, in community in a way that is like equitable and clear and accessible. Um, you know, we work on a cohort model. So we invite 
cohorts or groups of artists to come into space with us at the same time. And that means we need to ensure that when we welcome folks in, we are creating a platform and a container for that community building to happen. But the beautiful thing is that as we start to try and foster it, we then hand it over and, you know, the artists build those relationships and have beautifully creative ways of um, being in community and relationship with one another. Um, and it also means that our, you know, shared communal spaces then are organized by them in the ways that make the most sense for their group and for, you know, the sharing that needs to happen. Um, and that kind of space sharing, it feels like our kind of only way forward at this point is given the, um, yeah, given the way the city is continuing to develop and the way funding is working right now. Um, before the pandemic, we already had a crisis around um, small venues closing and there being fewer and fewer of them um, being viable, um, especially in, yeah, lower Manhattan and um, so many of them have closed before and continue to close. And so being able to not only fill those spaces, but organize them in a way that is like meeting the needs of all the people who are in community in them um, feels really exciting and hopeful around something that I think sometimes feels very limited. What are your challenges? What makes your job complicated and you wish would be different? This is a great question because I was actually just about to speak on this from, from Ava's comment. Um, when we're talking about spaces and especially about offering space to historically excluded communities um, and populations, um, you know, and I won't mention the exact situation, but we also have to be mindful of, you know, making sure that we have advisors and councils on how to work with, how to accommodate these communities. Um, they can't always, I want to be very careful how I say this, um, I'll just say, it. speaking in draft, they can't always adhere to the, the space rules, because sometimes those space rules are based on systems that don't apply to them. Or, or that they're not accessible. Or them. exactly. And, and, and I'll say it, I mean, you know, we were working with um, a trans artist, and, you know, there was some tension in the way that she was working and the way that we usually offer space. And that's just because we did not have the right counsel between us to have the conversation of how should this happen? How do you work? Because in our mind, it was you're using our space, so this is the way you're going to use it. And that's not fair. And that can be oppressive. Um, so we have to be very careful. For us, that was a, a big challenge is, you know, not necessarily um, expecting or, or not take out necessarily, expecting everyone who comes into the door to, um, to be ready and to be knowledgeable of, you know, industry standards or industry rules um, and, and adhere to those. Um, when we're speaking about comfort and, you know, making a space feel like home, just being open to new ideas, new populations, um, and, and new working styles. Yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, I think working with our, we have a fellowship program for emerging artists, 18 to 26, and I found that the artists we've been working with have stretched us and challenged us in really beautiful ways. And, um, and you know, and for me as an artistic director, I have taken to me to moments where I've gone, okay, I'm going to trust this and I'm going to take some risks and I'm going to, and I've had some, I mean, it was really good debriefing with some of the fellows I worked with. Like they were like, this is one of the few programs where I actually didn't feel shut down when I, when I brought an idea to you that was maybe outside the box or confronting to maybe traditional theater expectations of audience experience or whatever it might be. And so I think creating a culture where there is a willingness to listen and to be artist-centered in how you uh, program and curate. Well, we recorded. I just was wondering if you could use a couple of examples. We're talking in very general, almost political terrain, right? which I probably agree with. But I don't know what it means that you're some artist is doing something that wasn't 
palatable or acceptable or understandable in your spaces. And there were certain rules that were suspended. I mean, what does that mean to somebody who's not completely involved in an organization? Thank you for that question. Um, and I'm um, yeah, and, and, I'm sure there's privacy related to that specific topic, but one of the ways that can be is percussive dance or drumming or it depends. it depends on the space. It depends on the space, on the space right? Space. So like there may be like I'm I'm using a politically correct um answer just so that the privacy of that artist is respected. But you know, I think I, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I didn't want to put you on the spot. So I think that there's rules that um, we think are standard, but there are art forms and artists that have to often work outside of those bounds. We as venue operators have a duty to serve the artist, but we're also the ones that are beholden to the building. And so that's a complicated thing to navigate, right? Like um, we need to navigate it and we need to bring in counsel and make sure. So like, but it, we could be talking about something as simple as tap, tap, <laughs> dancing, right? And how it might affect a floor or our neighbors or, you know, any percussive, anything. I may give you one example too. Like there's a, there's a, one of our fellows is named Rocket James and he's an incredible dancer and DJ and he produces an event called Rounds of Flame, which is a dance battle. And it's an event that we're really proud to to support for many years. And but there were also challenges because we and you know and it's like creative adjustments. We were doing the event and like we have staff, we have to think about it. The event would always run too late, and as it got later, people would start partying and things would get a little wild. And you know, so we we talked and we sat down and said, you know what? Since the context of our venue is a community based space, and maybe that context would work in a different space in a different context. We said, let's do, we're going to do our version of Rounds of Flame from four to nine. So we just adjusted the time and it really shifted the whole dynamic. And then we also, but we also, there were, there, there was also a, some, at one point, there were some people within our organization who didn't want to bring, that were concerned about bringing the event back. And I was like, this event is so important. Um, and so we sat down and we said, well, what are the concerns? Let's get the concerns out open. Let's meet and have a dialogue. And then as a group, institution, artists, let's shape something that's sustainable and, and, so that's one example, like just moving it earlier in the day shifted everything. Yeah. 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 That's the process. But but some places, but in a lot of cases, in a lot, in a lot of in a lot of cases, that event would just never have come back. Yeah. But 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 also you're saying that from your perspective, a simple, you know, consideration. We decide to do it or not do it, but we couldn't. Hey, I didn't, I just wanted to... Yeah, but, but then also e even outside of the actual space, like I said, working with the trans artists, you know, as Baba mentioned about, you know, even, you know, checking in with security, that was a concern for them. I mean, we don't have security in our building, but we did a performance with another trans artist, and that was a concern, like, how is security going to treat us? Um, you know, making sure that there are accessible restrooms. They don't may not feel comfortable going to the gender multi-stall restrooms. Um, do you have other restrooms in the building? Like these type of accessibility issues, all these things are. Yeah. 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 Question for Anita: You have pioneering done pioneering work also over decades. Um, has it become easier or more complicated? You connected so many artists and so much, so much space. Uh well. We used to have a lot of fun and have lots of parties and <laughs> give keys to any artist that we know. And now we're an institution and I have property owners contacting me to give me space constantly. And my issue is not enough money and time and people to take on all these spaces. So it is definitely much more complicated and harder than it used to be. So you have more offers than before, but you don't have enough staff. To implement, to implement. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, an interesting model from the late in the early '90s that I stumbled on: uh, an independent gallery, no no connection to any nonprofit, decided that they would support renegade spaces, and what they did was they. Uh, said people, you want to 
find a space, storefront, wherever, come to us, we'll give you insurance because that's what the owners of the places need. And when they had insurance, they also gave them their mailing list. And sometimes they had extra chairs. Sometimes they didn't have extra chairs. But the, the, the responsibility was on the artist to find the space. And all they did was not get special insurance. They used their local insurance because they did an external project outside of theirs. So they didn't have to pay anything extra on their insurance. Just a thought. Yeah. We're doing something like that. It's just been very hard for my staff to get there. Instead of giving to individual artists, we're going to move to giving to uh, organizations. So we're not programming 150 shows a year. And, um, so yeah, so we're moving towards that. And then I'm scared to give anybody my insurance. <laughs> I mean, yeah, to be, that's, that's a challenge. And that's something we went through with the mural, mural project is um, this insurance situation. I mean, you want to talk about capitalism and rules and you know we're beholden to that system and and um you know one instance you know for a small nonprofit one instance where something goes wrong and our insurance rates go sky high we can't afford general liability insurance if we don't have general liability insurance we can't do anything so we have to be very careful in you know it's a great gesture it's a great thought but I want to make sure the doors stay open <laughs> there, are, there are risks yeah. Um, as an artist, I think one of the hardest things for me has been trying to expand and grow for what I call my village or my people. And insurance is like number one because I wanted um one of my biggest projects was to do with LMCC and Franklin Furness a block party, and it was a protest party in front of the until a church between 120 West 123rd and West 125th. And it was um, synonymous with the luxury picnics that so many European and they also have in Haiti. And I was turning it into a protest party as well. And we could not get insurance just because I practice the nude. So as simple as that, I use my body as a vehicle of protest, but also as a vehicle of exposure. And I say that to say this, how as liaisons for artists are you and in, in, in your individual ways from your organizations trying to reshape and rescope for um, exponential potent, dangerous work. It's interesting. I mean, I, I, it came up for me recently where there were several of our young fellows, one, two artists who wanted to work with nudity, um, which obviously nudity has been in performance for a while. I mean, were, Living Theater was an early, you know, a breakthrough on that front. But um, for me, it came down to it was integral to the meaning of their work. And so we supported it. And we, we, we felt it. It was it was part of the integrity of what was being communicated, and it was vital to the execution of the piece. And um, so we we supported them in that process. I think it really depends on the scenario of the space. When you're working with a traditional lease, there's this long list at the back of the lease of prohibited uses, and we you can lose your lease. Right, if you if you allow work in that space, um, that's why we need to own spaces, everybody. Why we need long term ownership and spaces so that we can appropriately program them. Nudity gets is lumped in to that long list of prohibited uses, and so often the people that are the leaseholders don't want to actually hold you smoke. Right, it's a smoke machine. It's food service and nudity. Um, it seems random. <laughs> You know, but it's there. So that's very right. yeah. It's, it's no glitter, also no. Glitter. Um, but so sand. Yeah. Sand. <laughs> yeah. So those things are often prohibited above the operator of the space, and so one of the ways to combat that is for us to own our spaces and not be beholden to anybody else, so that we can freely program them. 
I just want to say one tip on, on insurance. This will not cover everybody and it is not would not have helped you in a block party, unfortunately. No. But for those that are itinerant companies that are just rehearsing for a short period of time that maybe do one show a year or two shows a year, which is most of small theater companies, you can get event insurance instead of general liability insurance. You are properly covered in the same way. You can get it for like 200 bucks. This is a big, everybody thinks they need a general liability policy that's thousands of dollars a year, and they're mostly not doing a show. So you can just be covered for the period that you're in rehearsal and performance, and it can be inexpensive. So just for everybody out there, don't spend money on a general liability. If you don't have an office and you're not working together out of, you're in your homes, only insure yourself then. Don't come back to me. During That's production. a problem later. But just, you know what I mean, you know, like uh, just try and you can save yourself thousands of dollars a year. Um, how is the relationship to the city of New York? Do you feel it's more open on the arm, but it was more closed? How, how is it at the moment? I feel like we've had a lot of strong relationships with some of our local council members and support. Um, I feel like those relationships have been strengthened recently for me. The longer you are at it, the better the city supports you. And you have to engage with them. Like you can't, it doesn't happen accidentally. I tried to make it happen accidentally for a really long time. And it just, it didn't. It's funny enough, I had to meet with them in order for them to know what I was doing and or what we're doing at Indie Space. So um, one of the, a good way to start engaging for space access is even with your community board, that some of them are wild, you know, it's like, a, it's theater. it is theater, <laughs> I was just going to say, um, but you need to engage with your city council members. The hard part, again, I'm, I always am focusing on itinerant companies, individual artists, you're often not doing your work in your neighborhood. So you're a voter in your neighborhood. That's where you're a constituent. And so that's tough, right? And, but again, it's over time in election years, get to your new city council people because they have a whole new roster of people that they're ready to support. But um, I think the city is desperate right now for some answers and some innovation. And I think that we have an opportunity in front of us and I hope we're all seeing it that way. Um, there's lots of rezoning that's happening. The whole garment district is in the process of a rezoning. How are, that's where you talk, start talking to your community board. They can have some influence there. Your city council member can have some influence on making sure, making sure that artists are considered in those decisions. Every new development in New York City should be forced to have a cultural carve up. We like quiet spaces we like dark spaces they don't we don't even need a window and we like windows sometimes but sometimes only performance spaces don't want them there isn't one in here yeah. we like being in here so they're quiet they're cool they're dark they don't make those owners that much money right they're they can be income generating space but they're not high income not generating space yeah. right so let, give them to artists and in exchange, have a bunch of happy artists, increase the positive foot traffic in the neighborhood, uh, increase your photo, you, you, you know, your building will be on social media. Nobody otherwise cares whether your building's on social media. You know, there's a lot of things that we should be doing in this moment when we feel we're at a crisis or an inflection point. This is the time that we should be engaging with development. This is the time that we should be engaging with our city. And we need artists. We're not gonna recover. The city's not gonna recover without them. So take it or leave it, you know, and we also need to be talking about rezoning and affordable housing, not just, you know, it's, we're talking about performance. Right, so the artists can live here. That's it, right. So we don't lose them, especially technicians. We're losing technicians. That's, that's, right that's too. a real issue. Yeah, and I think a part of that is also just, it's it, the affordability crisis and then the kind of gentrification that happens. And so part of the work that is, is at the intersection of like place-based advocacy, place-based, um, connection with the city council people, but also making sure that the cultures that are present in the communities that have been there for a long time, like the bed styles like the Crown Heights, um, I live in Flatbush, which is largely West Indian. And, uh, you know, like if you got your African drum class going past 9 p.m., people are calling the cops, right? So it's, again, like how do we find places where we can be ourselves and be understood and not be under threat? 
that we can also afford. So that intersection is, is key. What would be a small thing that could change and make it much easier, like from your experience? And we have Anne Washburn here, the playwright, I think we sent an email to you, she does what she called the murder room investigation. Imagine New York downtown theater is a dead body or has been beaten almost to death and you're investigating it. So she's talking since three months. So a lot of people are all encouraged to uh, connect to her. Um, and she says some of them are small change that would make a big difference. What do you feel would uh, make a gigantic difference? And it shouldn't be so complicated to implement. Yeah. I, I think one thing is better resource sharing. Like, you know, like when you have an artist in your institution, try to let them know about all these other institutions. Like just, I think sometimes people could stay a bit siloed. So I don't know, maybe some more efficient way to distribute that information feels important. Yeah, the thing, uh, this came to me earlier and I forgot to say it. Uh, one thing that is different is that Space Finder used to exist, right? Right? And then it ceased to exist. Uh, that's left us. Uh, what Space Finder? Space Finder was a, a hub for all of the studio spaces, theaters. They were like multiple types of spaces you could find on Space Finder. Um, that were they were also flagged for the ones that were accessible like you could book directly through space finder or reach the people it had the dimensions like there were pictures of spaces um and then they that went away and so this idea about centralized resources because one of the things we found in some of our research was also people being able to access the type of space that they wanted was an issue right so he's like you need you're a, a Indian classical dancer and you need a space that you can dance barefoot with your drums and your jingles. Where is that space, right? Oh, I'm, I'm a tap dancer and I need a floor that we can tap on. And you, I guess we're working on that. So I just want you to know that we're with Partners for Sacred Spaces and Bricks and Mortals, which is another organization that works with sacred spaces. They've already developed a very beta venually. It's don't it it needs it's on its way um but um we're going to work with them to incorporate indie spaces because we're all spaces right dance studios and rehearsal spaces because this was one place that you could list every theater every rehearsal space whatever it needed better search tools with the space finder also needed to not cost millions of dollars um and that so it was good for the venues and it was good for the artists a one-stop place like I think app. is it an app or a website? Uh, it's a website. It and the way it was, it was a website that came down. But um, we're setting up like a the setup will be like an Airbnb kind of site, meaning the venue can put post themselves with photos, dimensions, search Smart. criteria, um, and then you can book through there or you can book directly. Not all venues want to be booked there, so something is coming, but it's going to take a while for it to be any good. I'll just say that I'm I want to manage expectations, but it's coming. But one thing, a small thing I think we could do, aside from like a space search, is work with this. <laughs> the way artists earn means that they have a million 1099s and their income one year is low and their income the next year is high. This shuts them out of affordable housing lotteries That's immediately. Right. True. This is something that we can do to change the trajectory because artists almost always fit within the income brackets to be eligible for affordable housing. But because of the way our income works, they were at. And we have to change that because if artists aren't going to be a protected status and they're not in New York, we have to be thinking about ways that artists at least can be competitive in the affordable housing lotteries here. Yeah, that's artists are nowhere close to military uh, um, support. Right. Uh, I believe that empty space in New York that property owners can declare it as a, a you know, sort of, so they can get a deduction. And I think empty spaces should be taxed. Yes. So then they have an incentive to put uh, yes. artists in them. Um, that's, I think that would make a yeah. big difference. In Berlin, well, in Berlin, this initiative, if your space is more empty from three months, yeah. you're going to be heavily taxed, super heavily. I think New York needs something like that. Yeah. yeah, it's a vacancy tax, and they've talked about it a lot. And we need, but they need to hear our voices around it. It's super important because yeah. they keep them vacant on purpose, aside from the getting the right off for it. But they're also creating assemblages, right, with the future 
full avenue mm -hmm. development that they're planning no, to not every single, yeah it's important and it keeps a full available spaces high for price because it's right. as much there yeah i think one change um speaking uh about rent what randy just said is to rethink what we define as affordable yeah, yeah. that's true maybe we slowly um go over we have a great people on our panel, but always they're also great audiences, or even so, this is more or less an online how long panel. And we on our side, we are developing a website, which we want to call Theater Listings NYC. Yes. And it will be just to find uh, performances that are going on because things become impossible. Well, where to go? We can't even be unsubscribing to 30, 40 lists and still have a hard time. And so on though, we will also create, hopefully, you know, one would be how to find space and maybe we can then connect to your site, but also we would like to invite you to become all editors and suggest what's good, where people should go, what we should be seeing, and it's not commercial, and we no ads, and um, hopefully that will contribute to a use of space and then people will come and see it. But let's go to uh, our listeners here, our audiences. Um, can also be a comment, doesn't have to be a question, but these are, you know, um, a great experience people with decades of work behind. So it's a great moment to ask something. First, uh, just on the, the uh, vacancy tax, uh, I think the problem uh, politicians will tell you that runs into is the Constitution, that it would be unconstitutional. It's the takings clause. You can look that up. Um, I just want to say, as someone who has been making site-based performance for three decades, I would encourage you to rethink your belief that artists should be more in charge of running spaces. Uh, uh, I've dealt with so many artists and look, believe me, we become artists for a reason. We don't want to be masters of Excel. We don't want to know the difference between liability insurance and workers' compensation. We don't want to do a lot of that kind of work that you need to get discretionary funding to write all the budgets and, and craft all these narratives. So there's a reason artists should not be business people. Here's my compromise. Artists should be more on advisory councils I'll and take that. space to yeah. advise on space. I want to challenge you back for one second. When I was in England, they have a model where artistic directors are the CEOs, and then they have a producing director or general manager in addition. But they believe that the artist should be at the center of the leadership and decision making. And so I want to I want to say when it, when when that's not the case, I think we run into some real issues. And there's ways to create structures where artists are have the executive decision making, but have the infrastructural support to get the work done. Yeah, I would say artistic directing is a lot different than running the space. Well, so, I was but, but I'm just saying I'm just saying that I was an artistic yeah. director and a chief executive, and that that's a model that's working. But I, I would say for me, I, I don't think the problem is space. There is a ton of underutilized space out there, some of it run by artists. I mean, just in my neighborhood, Dixon Place goes unused a lot of the time. Um, uh, the Gene Frankel Theater goes unused a lot of the time. Access Theater goes unused a lot of the time. Uh, my gym, uh, a university settlement, rents out space in the Chinatown YMCA. I always walk by that place. It is always empty. I don't know why. I, you know. Uh, I think it's more of this awareness and how do we share these resources and, and how do we get people to know about that these places are out there and existing because so many of them are, are just sitting uh, dark right now. I throw it back to you. Have you been spreading the word about that? University? Actually, I did post on my Facebook page. Of right on. The, uh, right on. Right on. Right on. You know, but I will say the problem is not space. The problem Money. is back to the liability insurance, the workers' comp, the public assembly permit, the certificate of occupancy, you know, and believe me, I mean, I've been working in vacant spaces for a long time. They're out there, but it, you've got to convince the owner. And Jane Jacob said the same thing you said. Ownership is the key to all of this. Uh, well, because owners, they're scared they're going to get sued. Yeah. Rightly so. Another ball guy. Uh, <laughs> to uh, go one step further, the uh, there's a lot of uh, larger arts organizations, and in the description for this panel, they said, "Well, the Shed, Lincoln Center." There's a bunch of organizations. I think the Shed has some issues, but Lincoln most have been three months. Well, January, the Shed in March, no artists inside. The Shed has lot, lots of issues. They're extremely wealthy and has lots. Nita probably knows about them. Um, 
But uh, say Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center now is uh, trying to reinvent uh, themselves. Henry Timms is thinking about how to make the space so that people can actually come in, spend time there. There's no uh, velvet rope over a lot of the space that you can come in and hang out like the, uh, the Geffen Hall uh, lobby. Anyone can go in there, spend all day there. They don't kick you out, which is very weird. I think it's great, but it's, there's not many spaces like that. Sorry. The fact that you think it's weird is part of the issue, though. I agree. Right. Well, I'm not an artist. I'm, I have an MBA in arts administration. So I am sort of the guy who runs things. I used to run the uh, events at Bryant Park for almost 20 years. And uh, so I gave away a lot of space for free if I could actually do that because I also had people that I had to report to. Um, there's a lot of space that is available, but there, the insurance issue is one thing. Um, the uh, costs are another thing. Artists want certain things, it's another issue. Um, so all these people want different things at different times. And then the uh, capitalism, which was brought in before, um, but I guess one thing that I was thinking about, and with, if CUNY is going to um, take one step forward to help artists to either find space, help people to find artists, is there a way to then uh, have these large organizations maybe fiscal sponsor with insurance, with uh, other means? There's gotta be a way to change how uh, people are thinking about what is not just space, but what are artists? Because I don't think the city is thinking that artists are going to change the city, even though artists change Soho, Chelsea, uh, Bushwick, um, keep, keep on going. But the city doesn't think that. Um, so it's not, the city is not going to listen to that kind of argument. The city is only going to listen to the developers, the people that have the money. I mean, we go back to someone uh, that's been doing this for a long time. Anita has been doing this, working with developers, working with people who have space, working with people who have billions of dollars who are thinking about things that they cannot, uh, they can't really justify having artists in their spaces until they're convinced. So how do we convince these all large organizations to actually support artists in different places? That's the big question. Mm -hmm. Their survival depends on it at this point. I think that's why I was saying we're in a moment. Their survival. We have, well, it, it just it depends on quite a few things. But if they're handing over keys to skyscrapers at this point because they're vacant, they have to, if they want to stay and they want to own, they're going to have to rethink their space. 50% of all in the tour, in more 49% of the statistic is it's empty of, of the space. Right. So just how we're all having to rethink work, we're all having to rethink audience habits, we're all having to rethink the way that we engage with each other, eventually they're going to have to come around. I, I disagree with you that the city doesn't think that artists are a way forward. I, I happen to disagree. I, okay. They keep asking us yeah. How are we going to fix it? They Basically, keep bringing a council together to talk about what or how to do it. So I do think that, um, you know, and they do give uh, that we need a lot more money, but they also give more money than any other state in the country. They have a bigger budget than almost just short of the NEA, <laughs> you know. So the city does. I mean, we're still only 0.25 percent of the budget. We need to be a one percent for culture, but that's. Uh, an argument that's been had for decades. We'll be back. January, check it out. Yeah, check it out. Um, but, you know, in order to create brave spaces, we have to rethink what the, our relationship to space and owners eventually come around, not always, not all of them. But I think um, when, when New York City's looking like the 70s and the 80s, we might, uh, that's when artists started taking over those spaces. That's when there was a resurgence of art and culture here. And it was subversive, right? We were taking over spaces. We were doing, we were squatting in spaces. We were using, we were doing galleries, just whatever. <laughs> Eventually, I feel like they're going to have to, they're going to have to come around. Um, and some of them do. I, like, they're not all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
I want to shout out two things. I think of uh, Here Art Center, where I was a resident artist for many years, and they were participating in one of those uh, office space programs and they had, like free office space, disused space. And I remember you rehearsing there and developing work, work in an office space. I want to shout out Perlman Art Center. Um, I'm doing some curatorial work there. I'm really glad to see their commitment to free programming in their lobby and their lobby stage. They have an open lobby space, which is a beautiful space that's going to be presenting intergenerational programming. So there are some shifts happening in the culture that we should celebrate. Oh, there was a... Uh, there was a great um, piece by Todd London today uh, in HowlRound about, you know, whether there is collapse and whether the whole thing is on fire. And he made the point in this essay that, you know, really there is no one size fits all, that there is no field, but there's a field of fields, that there's this proliferation of uh, different spaces, different needs, different artists, uh, different ways of doing the thing, right? Um, I've heard a lot on the panel today about um, a focus on artists and a focus on creating, uh, making space to create and to live and work, and that's excellent. Um, there is a proliferation of space um, that Randy has pointed out, that everybody pointed out. I'm wondering, um, how the um, shrinking audiences sort of fits in to our thinking or to you all's thinking about how we engage these spaces and activate community when, you know, that, that portion of um, earned revenue in some cases or ticketed revenue or just just bodies and seats, even when it's free, how it sort of perpetuates, uh, well, how does the artist engage with less of an audience? I mean, one thing I'll say to that is like, part of it is culturally relevant programming. You know, like I went to see Little Sims the other night. It's one of my favorite MCs. If you don't know who she is, look her up. And, and, and that show was sold out at Terminal 5 and it was packed. And this was, a, and it was a theatrical performance as far as I'm concerned. So it's about culturally relevant programming and aesthetics that are relevant to New York. And then I'll say again, it, it's about, you know, with the fact that audience behavior is changing, I work from home three days a week and I might more likely go to an event that's in Flatbush or the King's Theater or in, you know, in my like circle of close to home rather than travel to the city to go to something. So I think there's also something about investing in a uh, local neighborhood act like artistic and creative activity that needs to be happening. Um, that isn't only focused on uh, some of the like major breweries that we think about when we think about like performance and theater. Yeah, I'd say that all of the packed rooms that I have been in, you know, over the last year for arts programming has been in a neighborhood community center or a senior center or, uh, yeah, a sacred space. It is it is programming that is deeply connected to the community and neighborhood that it is being made for and wants to be in conversation with. And those rooms, like those artists don't seem to be having a hard time filling them. And it's really exciting to think that like, every neighborhood in the city has a community center, has a space that could be vibrant in that way with arts programming. But I think those, those connections have to, to have to be built and developed through the artistic process, through you know, a genuine relationship to neighborhood and the people that you want to be inviting into your process. As someone who's had a lot of shows with a lot of empty rooms, it is definitely very difficult to get audience. Um, I've often thought about the concierge of hotels and connecting with them. I think it's about letting, it's, it's hard to let people know when there's so much noise in New York, it's hard to connect to people. So it's, it's not, a, not I've, I haven't figured it out yet. Well, we, we hopefully hope that maybe our website will help and say what's just sugar on the shelves and yeah, something yeah. and what is good organic 
product, even if it's small. Um, I think we're a bit over time. Um, I want to thank you all. We had one uh, panelist with us, Jamie Carson, who said we have to think like Descartes, the philosopher. Let's think of theater as a big bag of apples, and some of them are rotten. We have to toss everything out and then put the good one back. What do we keep? What is really good, but what is not working is not working. And the subscription system is not working. It produced bad theater. It didn't produce audiences. Some of it, of course, good, but it put handcuffs on a lot of things. So this maybe it has to go. Maybe then we have to radically rethink. Maybe it has to happen in all the boards, in the parks outside and in the big spaces and that they are used in a way um, that um, they are beloved by their neighborhoods. Whenever people say, I often have people say, we have to connect to the community we are in and they live there, say, well, this sounds like you're not part of it. What, what are you talking about? You know, as if you bust them and out. And as my final comment, and also to what other people said, there's Goethe, a German uh, playwright and writer who said, you know, if you have your own home, do you need a painting at the wall? You don't. Do you need a carpet? You don't. Do you need a nice, beautiful sofa? Do you need flowers? You don't, but you want it. And the city is a living room, is a living space. And New York City wants to be a cultural capital, not only of America, North America, the Americas of the world. The city will have to invest, the city will have to reconnect. And the city is a great city and will come back. It has done so over centuries, but it has to have a real commitment. And I think the times of just the commercial theater that it was good enough are over. And I think this is the ushering of a new beginning and it's a painful birth. And I hope this panel, and I want to thank you all for being here, is part of it. And thank you all thank you for listening to this and to HowlRound. And I hope we made a little contribution to this. Thank you.